and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. Welcome to Consider This. This is the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider what you know of the news of the day. Recently, Joho and Penang have made headlines with their push for a larger share of taxes they collect. Now, Joho, at the urging of Regent Tunku, Sultan, um, Tunku Ismail Sultan Ibrahim, is seeking 20 to 30% of its collected taxes, while Penang is seeking 20%. Now, these demands are raising important questions about decentralization and financial autonomy. So additionally, we have in the conversation Sabah and Sarawak's unique position under the MA63, which adds complexity to these discussions. So how should Malaysia navigate these demands for greater state revenue retention? Joining me on the show to discuss this further, I have Professor uh, Economist, Professor Dr. Jomo Kwame Sundram, as well as Dr. Trisha Yeo, who is the CEO of the think tank Ideas Malaysia. Thank you both for being on the show with me today. Um, Trisha, if I may begin with you. Uh, we have Joho pushing for 20 to 30 percent of uh, its tax revenue to be returned. We have Penang seeking 20 percent. How do we think this through? What, what goes through your mind, so your mind when we have these states requesting for more uh, financial autonomy? Okay, thank you, Melissa, for having me. So uh, at the outset, I'd just like to say that, you know, many scholars have called for decentralization uh, or greater autonomy for states for a number of years now. Mm. Uh, so it's positive on the one hand that these discussions are now taking place in a very much, uh, much more real manner. Um, however, one might also have to caution that these discussions must take place in the context of the entire nation, right? So it's not just about one or two states demanding greater autonomy, but we're talking about how states collectively can come up with a more systematic, structural, uh, perhaps way of looking at autonomy. So that's the first point. Okay. Um, the second point is that I believe the reason why states are doing this now is because for the longest time, the ways in which finances are distributed from the federal to the state government are not bound by clear enough fiscal rules. If there were rules that were using a certain formula which was not political, which was not determined by the political affiliation of one coalition government mm. uh, in the state level or not, perhaps then these demands would not be um, happening now. So I've proposed, for example, in the past, an apolitical grants commission, the likes of what happens in Australia, where uh, it's, it's very clear there's a formula and it doesn't really matter whether or not the states change hands. So based on these two points, in response to your first question, um, basically, in the Constitution, it already states what kinds of grants the federal government are to give to the states. There is no such mechanism where a percentage or proportion of tax revenue is returned to the state. So that actually doesn't exist. Oh. It's returned in a form of grants. So in the recent meeting that uh, Penang Chief Minister had with Minister of Finance too, he already came out to say that proportion of tax revenue is not possible, but they could negotiate on the grounds of different sorts of grants. Um, I'll stop there for now, but basically even the grants, only a few are based on formula and the rest are discretionary. So the discretionary part, I think, is what's um, problematic right now. Okay, all right. Very interesting. Jomo, how do you make sense of this? The fact that we have states now saying, well, actually, we want more money. We want more of the money that we are contributing to the federal system. We want to retain more of that. How do you make sense of that? Well, I think this is predictable. Mm. It happens in many places. But it's important to note that the two states we are talking about are both states in the peninsula, which are actually the richest states. Mm. And, uh, these are th and this basically means that the potential for using the fiscal system, the federal, federal fiscal system, to redistribute from the wealthier to the to the less wealthy uh, is will be diminished if if you give in in a piecemeal fashion nonetheless there is a need for order and we have a system which has been largely determined by first the the uh, constitution of 1957 
and then revise in the constitution of 63. Of course, there have been subsequent amendments, but we do not have, for example, a kind of mechanism comparable, let us say, to the National Finance Commission in India, where every 10 years they review the situation and there is a, a reallocation of funds and so on and so forth, and even the basis for the reallocation of funds. For example, if you discover some new uh, mineral, how much of it would accrue to the, to the state? Right now, except for petrol, oil and gas, uh, everything accrues to the state. Uh, um, and this is, a, this is an artifact of the arrangements with, where natural resources basically accrue mm. to states and revenues associated with natural resources. Um, and we saw a lot of problems associated with that. For example, there was very excessive logging in many places. And so in 1982, if I'm not wrong, um, the National Forestry Council uh, basically was able to reduce uh, logging in the peninsula. Uh, it has not been able to assert itself very significantly in, in more recent period. But if we look, for example, at Sabah and Sarawak, there was no uh, such controls. Until uh, after the uh, changes in the, in the state government, I think at the beginning of the 1990s, if I'm not mistaken, in Sabah, so you then had a virtual moratorium on, uh, on logging uh, in, in at least certain parts of Sabah, uh, but no such thing in Sarawak. So you can't leave things like this, which are very important for a variety of reasons, to the whims and fancies of, uh, of the autonomous arrangements. But I think we also have a complication in this, in this country because of the terms of, agree the, terms of the incorporation of the new states into Malaysia uh, were different from the terms of incorporation of, of uh, uh, the, the states in the uh, federation, in the peninsula. Right. So all these things need to be considered and the fact that there, you had different status of the different states uh, in the peninsula. There was the straight settlements, the federated Malay states, the unfederated Malay states, and one should make a distinction between the unfederated Malay states, which were part of the Siamese Empire, <laughs> and the unfederated Malay states in Johor, for example. And all of them have, so there are a lot of complications which need to be carefully considered. And this, I think, is part of the challenge which we face. But if you were to take all of that into consideration and think about the ways in which federal governance has worked for Malaysia, ha has it worked for Malaysia? Is this um, system of federalism working? What's not working, Jomo? Well, I think... I think the, what does it mean to say whether it's working or not, right? right? Um, the, the system has not been fundamentally challenged until relatively recently and the challenge has come mainly from Sabah and Sarawak mm. but more recently of course we find that the other states have, have raised these issues. There are many different issues which are very complicated which do not lend themselves to a simple formula of federal state. So for example, the whole question of oil and gas revenue. Uh, you know uh, the, the 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 oil field uh, in the off the east coast does not stop when it reaches the Kelantan border. Right. It goes into Kelantan. So how do you estimate? How do you what? How do you ascertain the the share the, the fair share mm -hmm. uh, to go to 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 Kelantan? And of course the the petroleum oil and gas revenues in peninsula are quite different from. Uh, that in, in for Sabah and Sarawak. And of course, this changed very fundamentally in 1966 uh, with after the um, uh, Stephen Kalong Ninkan was ousted as chief minister and the continental shelf uh, 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 law uh, went through. So there are a lot of complications. So to, to reduce it to a uh, question of whether federalism is working in this country, um, you know, it's, it's very difficult to say that, but I think uh, by and large, certainly in the peninsula, I don't think there are major stresses to the, to the Federation. Where the, the major stresses are now, and sentiment especially among younger people in Sabah and Sarawak, is growing about the need for greater autonomy and, and there's even some degree of separatism which is beginning to brew. And I think we should be cognizant of that. Unfortunately, many people in, 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 uh, in the peninsula, including politicians, are not very cognizant of the special conditions in Sabah and Sarawak. And this is, of course, the subject of what Trisha wrote about in her thesis. Mm. Trisha, 
adding to that conversation, when you think about the factors that are driving th this conversation now, really it's come to the surface now, um, and adding MA63 to the conversation, how do we um, think through this when we want to give states more uh, fiscal autonomy, either through grants or as you um, pointed out earlier, without sort of jeopardizing the spirit of, the, uh, of federalism on which this country was built on? So if you look at um, federalism as a whole, I mean, the literature actually says that when you have... So there are many reasons why federations come together yeah, okay. in the first place, right? So uh, in, in some cases, it's to contain certain um, ethnic extremities and you want to bring people to the centre. In other cases, uh, yeah, it's about regional demands and you come together based on the belief that uniting uh, would make a collective value add mm. as opposed to operating economically separately. Uh, and you can look at the historical conversations. Um, we had a lot of those historical conversations about centralization versus decentralization uh, way back, right? When these fundamental documents of Malaya and then Malaysia came together. So, in a sense, this conversation is not new, it's just resurfacing today. Um, so, just on, on that point, when you talk about Sabah and Sarawak, um, we have to admit that there are separate rules that govern the ways in which the two East Malaysian states operate, right? Mm. Um, so, there are definitely pressure points that are taking place there. But again, I would actually still like to see the conversation um, together with the rest of the states in Peninsula Malaya, okay. Peninsula Malaysia, mm -hmm. um, because it is a question that will affect the other states as well. The demands for greater autonomy, um, oil and gas revenue, especially in Sabah and Sarawak, will leak over into states like Kelantan and Terengganu because these are the also two other oil producing states. Uh, what I'm saying is that these things have an effect on each other and uh, I, I still would like to have the, to see the conversation taking place in, in a more collective fashion. Um, but I, I want to go back to the ways in which like money is distributed, right? Because we have something uh, perhaps not as effective as India's National uh, Finance Commission, but we have a National Finance Council. Okay. So the National Finance Council, which is chaired by the Prime Minister, um, has a membership of all the different chief ministers of the different states. And unfortunately, there isn't actually very much um, transparency <laughs> around how the NFC meetings are run, how they're conducted. Um, there are no minutes that anyone in the public has access to. Decisions are sometimes made by way of, uh, or announced by way of a press statement. So the press statement will, will state, okay, these are the decisions that were made in the council. Um, but what's the basis of it? Uh, are there justifications for it? Uh, in my own research, I also know that sometimes these negotiations over development funds or funds for flood mitigation, for example, um, they take place outside the NFC meetings or on the sidelines okay. of those meetings. So how do you, um, you know, codify these informal conversations? And for me, that's actually the, one of the main things, that there is a lack of transparency, how decisions are made, how funds are decided. If that was uh, clarified greater, then perhaps, like I said at the beginning, the demands wouldn't be, be there. But also, there's two things, right, how we see states becoming more financially autonomous. One is how the federal government decides to redistribute the funds to the states. The other, which is less talked about, is um, how states may be able to raise their own revenues. And in the constitution, any revenue raising still requires federal government approval. So whether it comes to um, states you know, raising bonds or sukuk um, or local governments still don't have those powers. I mean, local governments come under the state government purview. So in many federations, states also have the ability to raise their own uh, consu consumer tax, so basically like a form of a GST or an SST. Uh, we haven't even resolved that question at the federal <laughs> level, so I'm not saying we go into it and launch into it right away, mm. but um, I'm saying there are many pieces of the puzzle that need to be considered if we're going to actually review mm. the ninth schedule. So the ninth schedule and the tenth schedule are the two schedules in the constitution that determine, number one, policy autonomy, 
and number two, the financial fiscal space. Final point for now is that if we're going to talk about fiscal decentralization or increasing the amounts that are being passed to the states, that conversation cannot be isolated from a conversation around policy devolution. So right now, um, it's not fair to say that we as a state need all this extra money because we need to pay for better education and health. That's inaccurate. It's inaccurate because education and health are still federal matters under the federal list and the states would pay nothing uh, for hospitals and schools. It's all funded by the federal government, right? Um, but if we want to talk about greater policy autonomy, mm. even by a slight amount, then it has to be coupled with a conversation around fiscal autonomy. Yeah. Those two things have to come hand in hand because you have one without the other. Uh, not only will it not work, but I don't think it's justified. Right. I mean, that, that's a really fantastic point. And it brings me to what was said by the um, regent of Johor about wanting to be, quote unquote, an equal partner to the federation. What is at the heart of that speaks to more recognition, perhaps, from the federal government as to the um, autonomy of states? Johor, how do you read that when you think about how much decentralization ought to happen or how much autonomy ought to be devolved from the center uh, for states concerns to be addressed like like Johor for instance the reason I mentioned the Indian uh, Commission is ironic India calls itself a union of India it doesn't it doesn't mm. admit to being a federation, federation but for all intents and purposes it functions as a federation much more than say our country mm. which calls itself uh, which calls itself a federation but in fact the the amount of autonomy enjoyed by the states is actually less than for example in india of course we are talking about different size countries and so on and so forth but this i think is a very important distinction so we have to be very careful about words and what words mean because they change in meaning historically as well as contextually um, and so on now um, what would what would work? Um, I th I think this this is a very very difficult discussion to have, um, and there are no easy formulas. That's why I think th this program should, in a sense, encourage further discussion because there is a real need to cons to consider various different issues. Because if we see the federal financing arrangements, federal fiscal arrangements, as a means of redistribution. What are we going to regress? Are we going to redistribute progressively or regressively? Okay, do we uh, do we redistribute in favor of the rich or to the poorer? Mm. And and for example, we know that that Sabah is uh, you know has more uh, poor districts than any other state in the country by far. Uh, Sarawak has a bit, uh, Kelantan has, has some, and so on and so forth. So what what how do we approach this issue? Um, these are not easy questions and there will be very little consensus but there has to be give and take and I think it is important that we begin to open up these issues and, uh, and hear the variety of considerations involved because if you have, have a situation where for example certain states historically for example our export earnings our trade balance used to be very positive during the let us say during the 80s mainly because of the contribution of Sabah and Sarawak. Uh, but in the 90s, the, Sarawak the Sabah contribution went down because of the reduction in logging and so on and so forth. But those kind, although in a sense forestry is theoretically renewable, in, for all intents and purposes, much of this was not renewed. So how do you deal with this kind of question, which is a completely different kind of issue from, let us say, the oil and gas issue? Or, for example, if lithium is found in, uh, for example, in, in, in Pahang, we know there's lithium there. Previously, it was found in Perak, and now there's, there are claims that it is to be found in, in Kedah. So what does it mean? or water resources. What does it mean to, to, to share water resources across state borders and so on and so forth? And, and to some extent, we have to recognize that many of these borders were actually consolidated by the, in, during the colonial period. Uh, 
and and it and many of these issues are related to our colonial heritage which there is very little actual serious discussion of so sultan nazrin of perak for example has has, has published a uh, or is publishing a book uh, on on the history of perak and so on and so forth and there are some other studies which look at different states but i think we, we have a very very difficult discussion ahead so i don't have a very strong view mm. but i do think that uh, that it is important for us to keep the whole question of fairness uh, in mind as we try to to redefine a federalism for the future right. uh, because rather than just reflect being uh, being a sort of stuck uh, in the past uh, as it has tended to be yeah yeah, For and sure. I think, and apart from the the principle of fairness, um, of course, the principle of of self rule versus shared rule. So, in a federation, states need to be able to um, to compromise and negotiate with the federal government on on that principle as well, self rule and shared rule. Um, but I have a couple of points to add, which is number one, um, on the issue of biodiversity and climate change, if at the national level, Malaysia wants to meet its own climate change targets. Mm. It has to work with the state governments because mm. states have the jurisdiction over land and natural resources. Uh, number two, while we have a MA63 cabinet committee, we need to revive a parliamentary select committee on state-federal relations to manage many of these overlaps and unresolved issues. We used to have a PSC on state-federal relations in PH 1.0 federal government, uh -huh. but it no longer exists. Okay. I would definitely urge that this select committee is formed because these issues are relevant, timely, mm. and need some sort of uh, national discussion and resolution or not, you're going to have these conversations for a long time. So, so if we were to um, hopefully expand this to make sure that these are national conversations discussions that happen with kind of the with everyone at the table what needs to happen for us to make sure that this isn't just a one-off or it resurfaces every few years when one state or one territory makes a, a, a demand how do we ensure what what needs to happen for everyone to be willing to envision that future of federalism together like I, I'm trying to think of this national conversation and how we can kind of spur it forward um, Jomo do you have any thoughts on that I think um, Trisha hinted that the whole question should be to some extent um, depoliticized it should not be uh, it should not be captured by partisan discourses is it currently a a political conversation? Uh, well, I think part for the first time historically, we have an, a fairly assertive uh, Sarawak alliance uh, in the federal government and uh, also to some extent uh, a greater uh, assertiveness on the part of, of Sabah. This has of course changed the conversation, but whether or not it is uh, improved conversation remains to be seen. Because it's not very clear, for example, that, that for example, uh, going back to the question of land, for example, how are native customary rights being handled in Sarawak? On the basis of, of uh, you know, a frozen definition of property rights being defined in terms of photographs from the U.S. Air Force, which were taken in 1958. Mm. I mean, is that how we are to resolve our questions? Uh, very, very important questions because we remember that a lot of the agriculture which was being practiced at that time was Sweden agriculture or, or shifting agriculture where, where a, a lot of the cultivators were moving between different pieces of land. Now, that is no longer uh, an option, but it means that nonetheless, you need to ensure that it is still viable to do so. If you define and say that all other land which was where you cannot prove your, 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 your rights uh, way back in 1958 uh, becomes, uh, becomes the land of the state under the, you know, the principle of eminent domain, then you have a, 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 a problem where you have a lot of the pre-boomy com uh, communities, the rural pre-boomy communities feeling terribly uh, deprived. And then how do you deal with the fact that not that many of them are not involved in perm, in, in sedentary agriculture, but Sweden agriculture? And, and then what do you do with, for example, uh, 
communities mm. which are involved in, 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 in hunting and gathering, of which there are very few left now, but still, it is something which needs to be considered, not only in Sabah and Sarawak, but also in the peninsula with, with, with Orang Asli communities. Many Orang Asli feel quite threatened by much of what is said to be done in the name of development. So it, these are very, very complex issues. But having a conversation, a national conversation, where there is where many of these voices, which are not in the, it, which are not usually heard, uh, get to be heard, and and with a national media, and now there's less of a national media because of social media and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. But we need a conversation where people in in the peninsula begin to realize that the, that the conditions in Sabah and Sarawak, or um, for or, for many orang asli. Uh, are, are quite different. Mm. These are very difficult conversations, but it needs, um, in a sense, uh, the media are in a position to to orchestrate this mm. uh, in a way which 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 is, is non-threatening. And by having that prior conversation, when it when the political discussion happens, uh, you then have a much more balanced and informed discussion. But it's a very complex process, and I'm I'm hoping for some. For, for something you have to make which, the ground which, conducive for that exactly. discussion. Trisha. In 2006, when the federal government moved water resources or water services mm. from the state list to the concurrent list, uh, where both federal and state would then share in the decisions, they, um, the Ministry of Water at that time, did a huge national consultation. They went state to state to consult with and get feedback from all state governments because this was an active shift from one uh, list to the other list. So something similar needs to happen. I mean, at that time, of course, it was slightly easier. You had a VN uh, predominance at the federal and at all state governments as well, just before the 2008 uh, shift, right? Today, it will be very different. So we know that that conversation will be um, more provocative, more political uh, leadership from different parties will want to stand their ground. I mean, it is also about showcasing, right? <laughs> uh, leadership of the state, I represent you and so on. But in order for the national conversation to happen, everyone needs to come to the table. Um, it has to be a commitment, a willing commitment from all leaders, from all states, and a commitment to say that this system may have been working for a long time, but will not be sustainable in the long-term future. Uh, come to the table and to discuss it, hopefully in a way that is not political. Does it need to come from federal government? Does it need to be a federal government push? Ultimately, yes, because they are the ones who have the purse strings to release. Um, and again, the federal government too needs to see that it is in their incentive to do this in the long run. They too are in control of some state governments. Um, there's no certainty, I think we all know that, in the new uh, political framework of post-2020. So anyone can be in any place at any time. Uh, it is in everyone's interest to work on this collectively. Both of you, thank you for your insights, your analysis. I appreciate your time. That's all we have for you in this episode of Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris, signing off for the evening. Thank you so much for watching and good night.